Good evening, and welcome to Canbar Hall at the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco. Please be respectful of your neighbor by silencing your cell phone now. Photographs or recording during the event are not permitted. Emergency exits are located on both sides of the theater and at the top of the balcony. Please take a moment to find the exit nearest you. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks so much to all of you for coming tonight. I'm Barbara Lane, the Director of Arts and Ideas here at the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco, and I welcome you to this evening's program. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Um, Philip Hook will sign books following tonight's program, so take advantage of an opportunity to have your book signed, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Please do. The art world can be very confusing, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions, so we will come to you with a microphone. Just put your hand up if you have a question. And one quick note, um, a program coming up in the spring you might be interested in. There is a wonderful exhibition now at the Brooklyn Museum in New York called Killer Heels, 400 Years of Provocative Shoes. It's great. I just saw it last weekend. If you go to New York, see it. The curator of that program will be here with a PowerPoint uh, display and talking about the exhibition in the spring, so watch for that. It's gonna be absolutely terrific for all of you shoe freaks out there. And now for tonight's program. Wall power, provenance, market weather, all these terms apply to the often baffling international art market. And one of the most perplexing issues of all is how art is given a financial value. Our guest this evening is here to shed light on these and many other questions. Philip Hook is a director and senior painting specialist at Sotheby's. He's worked in the art world for 35 years, during which time he has also been a director of Christie's and an international art dealer. The author of five novels and two works of art history, including The Ultimate Trophy, A History of Impressionist Painting. Tonight's program is timely indeed, as earlier this week, thanks in part to the sale of Giacometti's Chariot, Sotheby said its highest total ever at the fall opening. Philip Hook is here tonight with his new book, Breakfast at Sotheby's. Please join me in welcoming him to the JCCSF. Thank you, Barbara, for that very kind introduction, though I feel rather inadequate not talking about killer heels. <laughs> but I hope what I'm going to talk to you about will amuse you and interest you, because I know from the outside, the art world, and particularly the art market, must seem a very, very confusing and strange phenomenon in that how does money get attached to art? How does value get attached to art? Why is one Picasso selling for 100 million and another for a modest 1 million? What are, the, what are the questions that you have to answer in order to establish the value of a painting? This is what I'm going to talk to you about this evening. And in so doing, I hope that I will draw together various strands that uh, are taken from my book, Breakfast at Sotheby's, which is, um, as you probably gathered, uh, a book about the guilty but ever fascinating relationship between art and money. So, let's, let's, let's start immediately on this investigation, uh, the 10 questions. Here we go. Question one, is the painting authentic? Well, you would have thought that this was a pretty obvious question. And certainly uh, that is, there, there are ex extreme positions. It's, it's like a, it's like a um, huge span of, um, with 
two polar op opposites at either end. One end is the totally authentic Rembrandt, say, that you can trace all the way back to the artist's studio, has an unbroken line of provenance, uh, and um, is in all the books absolutely undisputed. And at the other end, you've got the out-and-out -out fake that is a modern uh, pastiche and is of interest to no one except the student of crime, maybe. <laughs> so um, there are the two extremes. But oddly, in between, you have nuances. You have degrees of authenticity. And I want to show you this first slide. It shows a self-portrait by Rembrandt, or is it? Certainly in the 19th century, it was accepted as being a genuine work by the artist. It was in the collection of the Prince of Liechtenstein and could be traced back, if not direct to Rembrandt's studio, then certainly direct back to the um, end of the 17th century. So it, 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 had, it certainly had age. But, but in the 20th century, it was downgraded by current expertise to being just a follower of Rembrandt. Uh, and it came up for auction, interestingly, about three years ago. And it was estimated as a painting that was not considered to be genuine at something between ten and $15,000. And when it came up, it fetched over $200,000, which is such an interesting price because it's not nearly enough if it's genuine, but it's much too much if it's not genuine. So I just give you that as an illustration of um, the way there are degrees of authenticity. Authenticity was something that particularly preoccupied me uh, in the golden days uh, of a couple of decades ago, when I used to appear regularly on the BBC television Antiques Roadshow, which was the original Antiques Roadshow. And people were forever bringing in um, paintings that were not quite as good as they claimed to be. And one was having to let people down gently in their <laughs> expectations and hopes. And one day, Someone brought in a Rembrandt. Um, he was a garage mechanic, and he told me he'd accepted it in lieu of payment for a bumper that he'd mended. And I had to say to him, I was terribly sorry, but the painting was not actually the work of Rembrandt. Uh, and he looked a bit downcast initially, and then he brightened up because he said, well, it didn't really matter because the bumper had fallen off again the next week. <laughs> okay, next question. Is the artist fashionable? Well, artists go in and out of fashion, as, as we know. Um, and there are broader shifts of taste in what people want and will pay large amounts of money for. I mean, to, when I first started in the art market 40 years ago, the whole focus of glamour and attention and um, money was on old masters. And since that time, there's been a complete transformation. And now the money and the glamour is very much focused on contemporary art. Um, as an indication of this, you only have to look at the work of Francis Bacon, the great um, modern painter whose highest price 10 years ago was $8.5 million. Then last November, a work by him sold for $143 million. So it went from 8 million to 143 million in the space of 10 years, which is an indication of the way contemporary art is now absolutely where it's at in terms of fashionability. I've always had, and I have to confess this, um, 
I hope you won't, um, I hope you won't spread this news and therefore cause the Sotheby's stock price to collapse. But I've always had a problem myself with certain um, contemporary artists. And um, there's one particular one who is no doubt a very great contemporary artist, but she is uh, pretty um, scandalous and pretty sort of in your face. And her name is Tracy Emin. She is a British painter. She's what you might call a, um, an enfant terrible in French. Um, anyway, she was the cause of an probably the most embarrassing moment I have ever suffered at Sotheby's. I was it, in Sotheby's in London where I work and I think everyone else must have been away that day because uh, unexpectedly a minor member of the British royal family turned up at Sotheby's and as I was the most senior person there I had to take her round um, and I knew that there was some contemporary art on view, which I very much didn't want her to see, uh, but that there was very, very good pictures by George Stubbs, which I thought would be just up her street. So I said, come with me, Your Royal Highness. We will go and look at some pictures by George Stubbs. But suddenly, her eye was caught in the distance by a large, pink, neon piece of installation art by Tracy Emin. And she said, what's that I can see in the distance? And I said, you know, Your Royal Highness, you really do not want to look at that. Just come and, come and see the stubs. She said, no, 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 I haven't got my spectacles on. What's it say? What's it say? So to my acute embarrassment, I had to take her up to it and read it to her. And it said, kiss me, kiss me, cover my body in love, it said. And to her eternal credit, the member of the royal family turned to me and said, oh, she said, very erotic, she said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. How important is the artist in art history? Well, obviously, some artists are eternal and unchanging. You will always have a huge demand for one of the greats, for Rembrandt, for Titian, for... Leonardo, for Michelangelo, for, um, for Picasso, for Matisse. I think that is the, the, these are the eternal artists. But against that, there are certain schools of painting that are periodically reassessed and become more important. And as a result, their prices go up. I'm thinking particularly in recent years of for instance, the German Expressionists have been art historically reappraised. Their importance has been very much um, reassessed positively, and their prices, as a result, have definitely gone up. Similarly with the Surrealists. Um, also, something that can happen is if a particular artist is the subject of a major exhibition, a major retrospective in a big museum, then that can also create a spike in their prices. A good example of that was this painting by Miro. There was a tremendous retrospective of Miro uh, in the Tate Modern Gallery in London three years ago. And we managed at Sotheby's to get this painting into a sale simultaneous with that exhibition and I'm sure it was because there was so much focus of attention on Miro because of the exhibition at the Tate that when simultaneously this painting, wonderful though it is, came up it made a truly exceptional price of 38 million dollars which is still the world record for Miro, but I think it was a happy piece of timing that to coincide with a, with a major museum exhibition. So that can be a positive thing for prices. Next question. Does the artist have positive romantic baggage? <laughs> now you may laugh, but this is important. Our perception of an artist's work is conditioned by his myth as an artist, as the details of his life. 
And if the details of the, his life, his myth, his, the events of his life, the tragedy of his life is directly reflected in a painting, then that painting goes up in value. An unhappy love affair and the, lover, the love of the artist's life being depicted is very good news, very positive, both <laughs> emotionally and commercially. Uh, muses, well, the same thing. Madness, I mean, I hate to say it, but madness is excellent news from the price point of view. <laughs> madness, uh, if an artist can be shown to have been mad or going through a period of madness when he painted a work, then um, it's felt to be somehow imbued with something special because madness is close to creativity and uh, you know, great works of genius are produced in brainstorm conditions. Um, interestingly, illness is not nearly such good news. If an artist is recorded as having been ill when he painted something, it generally has a diminishing effect on prices because it's felt that he was not, he was not on the top of his game when he, when he painted it. Rebelliousness, yes, excellent. Dying young, the great commercial <laughs> career move. Because simultaneously, it limits the number of works uh, out there by the artist, gives them a huge extra rarity value. And also, I mean, there are exceptions to this, but by and large, I think most late periods of artists are not as good as their earlier, mid or earlier periods. So they could usefully be excised from the records if possible. Um, let's just look at this whole question of positive romantic baggage in its supreme example, which is Van Gogh, of course. I mean, quite apart from the art historical importance of Van Gogh as the inventor of expressionism. There is a sort of tragic romance to his life that enhances his value to the collector both emotionally and commercially. Um, this whole thing about madness, this whole thing about never being um, understood in his lifetime, it's great, great stuff commercially now. And I wanted to tell you about one thing that happened recently, which was a threat, in a way, to this perception of Van Gogh, which was a new biography that came out about three years ago, which suggested that Van Gogh did not actually commit suicide, that he was out for a walk in the country when he was shot by a stray peasant out shooting rabbits accidentally. Now, this was the most appalling thing from the market point of view. It, it, was a, it was a story that had to be suppressed instantly because we need Van Gogh to have committed suicide. It's part of his myth. And thank, thank heaven, um, this story, this version of Van Gogh's death didn't gain traction. It was rejected. So the market for Van Gogh is okay. As we saw on Tuesday at Sotheby's, when um, a Van Gogh flower picture, estimated at 30 to 50 million dollars, sold for 63 million, which was, shows that uh, Van Gogh is alive and kicking, which is great news. Okay, next, next question you have to answer. Is the painting from a desirable phase in the artist's life? Well, artists obviously do have periods which are more uh, and less desirable. And um, I mean, I mentioned just now that quite a lot of artists' late work is not as good as their earlier work. And I think in that category, one could uh, include um, Renoir, one could include well, actually, Picasso, um, too. But conversely, some artists did. I mean, Van Gogh was the exception here because he had a very short career. His latest work is his most desirable. Um, 
let's look at Picasso in particular here. This is Picasso at his most desirable phase in the early 1930s when he's very colorful, he's very sensual, his painting is very much tied up with his love for his new mistress, Marie-Thérèse. Uh, it's a wonderfully, wonderfully sensual work, this of 1932, and if it came up for auction now, would, I'm sure, fetch in excess of $100 million. Contrast that with this rather indifferent work of 40 years later. This is, um, I have to say, I'm afraid this is Picasso with a hangover. He, <laughs> He, he, he must have uh, woken up that day and not, not felt terribly inspired, and it really isn't a terribly good one. And these, some of these later ones are worth so much less. I mean, this would be hard-pressed to make a million dollars. Um, and partly it is a question of the period in which it was executed, and some of these late works are not so highly sought after. Question six... Is it typical? Now, typicality is very highly prized in the modern art market. Let's look at Monet. If you are in the happy position of having just spent $10 million on a Monet and you hang it up in your living room and you have guests round, you want them all to say, oh my God, you've got a Monet. You want it to be highly recognizable. You want it to be typical. And typicality is something that adds extra value quite apart from the question of the quality of the painting. So a painting like this of Monet's Japanese bridge in his garden at Giverny ticks all the boxes. It's typical. People would recognize it pretty easily. It's great and therefore very, very valuable. This one, on the other hand, well painted though it is, is not particularly what people want from Monet. It's a portrait of his daughter. It doesn't scream Monet at you. And therefore, when this one came up, it actually didn't sell. It didn't even get to its reserve um, some six months ago. So, although it's equally well painted or not at all badly painted, it's entirely the fact that the subject matter is not typical that very much reduces its commercial value. Next question. Has the painting got what I call wall power? Which is a difficult thing to define, but it is, I suppose, has it got the impact that really makes people want to own it? And this impact is created by a variety of factors, such as color, composition, emotional impact, um, emotional power, um, and of course, surpassing artistic quality. That is a, is a difficult thing in itself to define, but one knows it when one sees it. But I just wanted to talk about color for a moment in this respect, because it is amazing how important the color red is in giving a painting value, particularly modern paintings. Let me show you as an example this Mondrian. You can actually make a study of which are the Mondrians that make most at auction. I mean, they're easily comparable because they, in this classic phase of his life, of his career, he was doing pretty similar things the whole time, i.e. these grid compositions with squares and rectangles colored in with pure color. And it is clear when you make price comparisons that the ones that make most are the ones that have red in them. The ones that don't have red in them are lower down the price scale. It's very fascinating to compare, but red, it's not the, it's not the quantity of red, it's just the existence of red 
in certain situations that gives paintings value. And I want to go back to the picture I showed you earlier by Miro. And it is a very interesting thing with this picture that if you put your hand up and exclude that area of red at the bottom, it loses an enormous amount of power. And that red, although it's not very big, is absolutely crucial to giving it what I, what I call wall power. Okay, next, next, question eight. This is a big, big question. What's its subject? Uh, and what I am going to tell you now applies really much more to traditional painting than to modern painting. But nonetheless, there are rules with traditional painting that can be formulated about which subjects sell better. Well, certainly in the field of landscape, uh, sunny landscapes sell better than bad weather landscapes. Um, it seems ridiculously simplistic, but that is the case. Also, landscapes that you can identify. And I'm showing you this because, well, I'm embarrassed to see it, actually, because it represents um, a very, very um, shameful episode in my own early career. But this was a landscape that I had to catalogue many years ago. And knowing how important it is to identify the place depicted, I looked very carefully at the back of this painting and found inscribed on the back the information that it was a place called Mount Nog. And I looked in the gazetteer to see where Mount Nog was, and I found there was a Mount Nog, to my excitement, in New Zealand, because it's very rare to find paintings of New Zealand of this age. So I put it in a special topographical sale of pictures of New Zealand interest, and excitement built. But then tragically, the day before the sale, the picture had to be withdrawn because it was pointed out to me that it didn't, in fact, say Mount Nog on the back. It said Mount Number Nine, and it was Framer's instructions. <laughs> Let's go on to other subjects. I want to show you this in relation to portraits. And again, it's a very obvious thing, but it makes a huge difference. Portraits by the same artist of boring old men sell far less well than portraits by the same artist of very pretty women. I mean, by a huge differential. And I show you this picture by Sargent as an illustration. This is a very well-painted portrait, but of an undeniably rather boring elderly man um, that sold at Sotheby's for a few years ago for $30,000. Then this, also by Sargent, of a rather more accessible looking lady, sold the same year for $2,300,000. Uh, I've also got a theory about uh, paintings of women, that portraits of women, that if they're depicted horizontally, they make even more. <laughs> Unless, of course, they're dead, in which case the whole thing evaporates. Death is very bad news commercially. You don't want pictures with any sort of death in them. Uh, that you learn very, very early on. And I'm coming back to those two, but I want to just look to show you this still life, which I remember cataloging again early in my career. And I was so anxious to avoid any hint of death that I cataloged this as still life with fruit and sleeping duck. <laughs> Unfortunately, the market was not deceived and the picture failed to find a buyer, but there we are. Just let's go back to, this is another illustration of the way happiness sells and skulls don't sell. This is a really, actually, very beautiful piece of painting by Matisse. But it was incredibly difficult to sell simply because of the line of her mouth. It turns down. It's such a simple change. Just changing that line 
so that the ends turned up would have made such an enormous amount of difference to the price. As it was, because she's frowning, I think it sold for $1.2 million. But had she been smiling, as in this Matisse of similar size, we're suddenly looking at a $20 million picture. It's a huge, huge difference. I can't think what Matisse was thinking of in making this, <laughs> this woman skull. I mean, had he no regard for the problems of forthcoming, of, 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 his, of future generations of art dealers and auctioneers who would have to try and sell this picture, for heaven's sake. Uh, and then here is, here is a picture which um, I only put it in. I'm going to talk a bit more about it later. But I put it in now as an illustration of the way once one gets to modern art, the rules don't apply anymore. Because this is a painting of someone definitely scowling or certainly not happy. And yet, it, when it was sold at Sotheby's not so long ago, it made the world record price for any work of art. So we'll come back to that, Edward Munch, the scream, in a minute. But I just show it, as I say, as an illustration of the way that modern art does, can't be so easily fitted into these, these categories. Now, I'm going the wrong way here. I just want to take one more illustration of subject matter, and that is nudes. Now, nudes are generally good sellers, provided they're depicting attractive people. <laughs> the one rider to this is very, very major works of art which um, contain nudity. You have today to take into account whether they are going to be saleable to the new Middle Eastern museums, which obviously operate with very strict Islamic criteria about the naked body. And the interesting thing is that there is some flexibility here in the Middle East. This Cezanne, because it's fairly generalized and more to do with form than eroticism, probably would find a Middle Eastern museum to buy it. It's, it's, it's not too erotic, it's not too sort of in your face, whereas this Medigliani definitely would not be bought by a Middle Eastern Museum. So um, there is that element very much to be borne in mind with nudes. Then, finally, um, as a counter to what I was saying earlier about death, there is the possibility totally to transcend the rules in the case of a great old master painting. This is by Rubens. It shows, on the face of it, a not terribly commercial subject, i.e. an act of mass infanticide, the, um, the murder of the innocents, the slaughter of the innocents. Um, but because it's an absolute masterpiece by Rubens, then the subject matter doesn't matter anymore. And when this was sold at Sotheby's, uh, actually, nearly 15 years ago, we rather nervously estimated it, because we were slightly worried about the subject matter, at between, um, well, in pounds it was four to six million, so in dollars probably something like seven to ten million dollars, and it ended up making 75 million dollars. And um, it was, uh, as I say, an illustration of the fact that death doesn't matter if the artist is great enough. So that's subject matter. Question nine, is it in good condition? Well, paintings do age. And paintings get damaged, get worn, and sometimes they're restored. You can't always tell that uh, with the naked eye. You sometimes need uh, professional advice on this. And obviously, the more restoration there is on a painting, the more it diminishes its commercial value. But in some cases, of course, age is part of the attraction of the work of art. And in this connection, I will always remember with great pleasure a visit I made to the Fine Art Museum of St. Petersburg in Florida 
where a really delightful elderly lady docent took me round, gave me a tour of the museum. And she knew absolutely everything about every picture, every item that was on view. And I so well remember she paused in front of an antique head. And she told me that, she said, this head, she said, is 2,507 years old. And I said, that's absolutely amazing. I mean, how do you know so precisely that it's 2,507 years old? And she said, oh, that's easy, she said. I'd been here seven years, and when I came, it was 2,500 years old. <laughs> Okay, point 10 now. What's its provenance? Provenance is the history of the painting, the people who've owned it in the past, and a good provenance can certainly make a positive contribution to the value of a painting if a painting is shown to have been in, for instance, the great Paul Mellon collection, then that enhances its value. Conversely, if the painting you find in your hands unfortunately has the provenance of Field Marshal Goering, then that's not such good news and will probably diminish its value. But seriously now, um, in connection with provenance, I want to tell you a story about uh, a collection that uh, I've been working on for the past 15 years or so and is the most fascinating and in a way harrowing piece of provenance that I have ever had to deal with. It was a collection of an extremely distinguished German-Jewish collector called Max Silberberg, who put together in Breslau, before the Second World War, one of the great collections in Germany of French modern art, impressionist and post-impressionist art. Then the Nazis came to power, he had to sell his collection, which he did in 1935 in Berlin. It was dispersed, and some of the various pictures went into really major museums. Uh, for instance, this tremendous pen and ink drawing by Van Gogh was bought at the Silverberg sale in 1935 by the National Gallery in Berlin. Um, this was another painting here, this tremendous Pizarro of 1897, I think it is, um, that, but a, one of the great Parisian street scenes, uh, also um, was sold in the 1935 Silverberg sale. Silverberg himself um, tragically died in concentration camp and it seemed that that was the end of a very, very sad story. But then, fast forward to 1990. Now, 1990 is quite a significant year in the history of the restitution of art, particularly art that was stolen in the Second World War from Jewish owners. Uh, and the reason for that is that it was the end of the Cold War that the Iron Curtain came down and suddenly archives in East Berlin that had not been accessible before were available to scholars and a whole lot of information came out that was able to show conclusively that certain things had been stolen in the war and not legitimately um, changed hands. And the catalogue of the Silverberg sale in 1935 came to light, and from it, it was absolutely clear that the proceeds of the Silverberg sale in 1935 had not gone to the Silverberg family, but had gone to the Nazi party. Therefore, by international law, the whole sale was null and void, title hadn't passed, all the property in the Silverberg collection that had been in that sale was legally still the property of the Silverberg family. But who was the left of the Silverberg family? It seemed there was no one. A very, very tenacious German lawyer decided to get on the case and try and trace uh, any members of the Silverberg family. And 
his investigations told him that there was a rumor that just before war broke out in 1939, the son of Max Silberberg maybe had got out, and the rumor was that he'd gone to England. Now, in those days, in 1990, there wasn't, it wasn't possible to do the sort of research on the internet that you can do now. So this very tenacious German lawyer got hold of every single telephone directory in the UK and went through it for the name Silberberg. And miraculously, he came on the one Silberberg uh, who was indeed the daughter-in-law of Max Silberberg, the widow of the son who had indeed escaped, but then had, in the time, intervening time, died. But Mrs. Silberberg, the daughter-in-law of Max and the widow of the son, was still alive, an 82-year-old woman um, living in very humble circumstances in the city of Leicester in, in the Midlands in the UK. And suddenly, you know, there was a knock on her door and she was told that she was the owner of these two pictures of the, of the Van Gogh um, olive trees that we saw just now and of this uh, miraculous Pizarro. Now, the English press got hold of the story and made it out as if Mrs. Silverberg had suddenly won the lottery. It so totally wasn't like that. I mean, I, I spent quite a lot of time with her, and she, it was so clearly was a very, very harrowing experience for her to be reminded of her past. And I remember standing with her in front, just to go back to, again to the Van Gogh, standing in front of this marvelous drawing, and her saying, I mean, she was, she was obviously extremely moved. She said, the last time I saw this drawing, it was in my father-in-law's house in Breslau in 1934. And it was an incredibly emotional moment, that. Anyway, I suppose the happy end of this story was that, as I, I, I missed out a bit, because once the National Gallery in Berlin were told that this drawing had not legally changed hands in 1935, they very honorably gave it up immediately back to Mrs. Silberberg, and she, who obviously did not want to keep it in her house in Leicester, gave it to us for sale, and we managed to get five million pounds for it, about eight million dollars, and she immediately took some of the money and went on a very well-deserved cruise, which was something that she'd wanted to do all her life. So that, that, that was a, a bit of a happy ending. Uh, and then the other one, um, the glorious Pizarro, um, there was a sort of ironic further chapter in the story about this, because this had been in the Berlin sale in 1935. It had been bought by a collector and then changed hands, gone to one of the great American collectors, John Loeb, who, in total innocence, had then willed it, given it, bequeathed it to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. So that the Israel Museum suddenly found themselves in possession of a painting that had been looted from, a, from Max Silberberg, a Jewish collector. And they, too, behaved very, very honorably about it, and um, it went back to Mrs. Silberberg. Actually, she then left it on loan in the Israel Museum until her death, which was only last year. So for another 13 years, it stayed in the Israel Museum on loan from Mrs. Silberberg. Then her as finally sold it with us, uh, actually earlier this year at Sotheby's. And it was such a wonderful painting. And it ended up fetching $31 million in June in London. A fantastic, fantastic picture. But um, that is an illustration of how provenance can have such a fascinating resonance to a painting, give such extraordinary extra dimensions to it. Well, this, this uh, talk that I've been trying to give to you has been about how one establishes the value of a painting. But I have to end by saying there are sometimes occasions when um, 
we as experts really don't know what the value of a painting is. And I return to the monk, the scream, that we sold at Sotheby's two years ago. And this painting was unique in that, although there are four versions of the scream, three of them are in museums. So this was the only one in private hands. This was the only one that people would ever be able to buy. We simply didn't know what it was going to make, um, and it was very difficult to, to estimate it beforehand. I think estimates went from somewhere between $35 million, which was the previous world record for Munch, up to $150 million. No one really knew. In the event, it sold for $120 million, which was tremendously exciting. But such had been the interest in the painting in the weeks leading up to it that bookmakers had taken bets on what it was going to make. And you could, you could, you could bet you could, your prediction on, on what the monk of the screen was going to make. And what was so fascinating was that the shortest odds were offered on $125 million. They'd actually made $120 million. They almost got it spot on, which makes me realize that there is somewhere working in those bookmakers, an expert who knows far more than I do. <laughs> anyway, on that note, thank you very much for listening to me. Questions? There's one over there, Becky, and you had a question here? Start here in the front. I was wondering what commission Sotheby takes on its sales. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a variable amount, I have to say. The frustrating thing from Sotheby's point of view is that there is such an institution as Christie's, which um, acts as a break on both sides to the amount of commission that either can make. It is a perfect example of a duopoly functioning to the benefit of the consumer because you really cannot take more than what the market will let you take in commission on a major piece of work. So I couldn't possibly say what commission we took on the monk, but um, it was anyway irrelevant by comparison with the excitement of selling such a great picture. <laughs> what happened to the rest of the Silverberg collection? Um, the rest of the Silverberg collection has been the subject of various different agreements between current owners and the Silverberg family. Um, most of the pictures have been traced one way or another. And I mean, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that in these cases of restitution, where things have very clearly have been proven to have been taken during the war from a Jewish victim, uh, or from a, a victim of theft of any sort in the, in, during the war from, by the Nazis. Um, there is also a second victim who is the current owner who has bought the thing in good faith. And very often it is a question of reaching an agreement between the uh, lawyers of the Silberberg family and the lawyers of the current owner to a financial settlement, and they've all been very amicable, and some, there are some paintings that have remained in museums where the museum has paid compensation to the Silverberg family. So I think they're all just about settled now. The next question's right here. Hi, I actually have two questions. One is you said that there are some schools of art that later on are reevaluated and become more important and more prominent. What is changes in the art world to do that. And then the other question I had was the Reuben, which you said death was negative, but it also had quite a bit of red. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's absolutely true about the Rubens. Yes, well, many, many, many elements. And many, many elements work together to create new interest in different schools. Um, the interesting question that sometimes asked me is, do Sotheby's actually create the market? I mean, is there an, ele is there a is there an element of, of, of the auction house 
by focusing on particular schools of art, um, creating a market for that school of art. Uh, and the answer to that is that I wish Sotheby's did have that power, but they don't. I think it's, it's so interesting, this question you asked, because it, it is a combination of so many different factors of, of, yes, art historical fashion, art historical reappraisals, but also the sort of images that advertising men are using, the sort of images that um, people are responding to in so many different ways. It's, it's, it's a huge combination of factors um, that one knows when it's happened afterwards, but it's very difficult to predict or see how it's happening at the time. And if only one could, one would be now living in a villa in the south of France or something. I don't, it, 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 um, it would be great to be able to predict, but one never can. Question over here on your right. I have a two-part question for you. Uh, we'd like your provenance. Would you tell us how you started your career and how you've advanced, how you've developed, what have you done throughout? And then the second part is, in summary, could you give us a typical month of your life as you currently live it? Essentially, I guess we're looking for your own provenance. <laughs> well, my, yes, my own provenance is that um, I, I studied art history uh, at university and I actually then, from then on, have been totally in the art market because I went straight into Christie's from university and then um, I've been very lucky in the sense that when I started at Christie's, I was an old master uh, specialist, and I've gradually moved forward through my career in terms of the age of the paintings that I've specialized in. By the time I left Christie's, I was doing the 19th century. Uh, when I became a dealer for a while, I gradually started dealing in more impressionist paintings. And then, um, when I got to Sotheby's 20 years ago, I started doing uh, modern paintings as well. So I've got a, a good span of most things. But simultaneous with that, I've been very, very lucky to have had a career as a writer. And uh, initially, that career was as a writer of fiction. Um, I don't think I would ever have started to write fiction had it not been for a huge slump in the art market uh, <laughs> around about 1990, 1991, 1992. I was a dealer then, and my, uh, the, the partner with whom I was in business and I used to turn up for work uh, in the gallery and make telephone calls to prospective sellers and prospective buyers. And there was absolutely nothing doing at that point. It was, it was just an absolutely dead time for the art market. So um, he and I started um, to, go to, to go to the cinema in the afternoons. I think we saw every matinee in London. So that um, it was really because neither of us wanted to go back to our wives and have to admit that business was pretty bad. So we went to the cinema. Um, and then when we'd seen every matinee in the West End, I thought, well, this is an opportunity to do something I've always wanted to do but never had the time to do before, which was to write a novel, which I did. And um, miraculously, it got published, and I did four more after that. I can't say that my literary, my fictional, my literary fiction career was roses all the way, because I had a rather embarrassing experience uh, with my second novel, which won a literary award in the UK. Uh, that sounds rather impressive, but let me tell you what the literary award was. It was for the worst passage about sex in any British novel <laughs> of, of, that, of that year. It's called, it's called the Bad Sex Prize, and it's quite a famous prize in the UK. Anyway. Thank God I only ever won that once. That was, uh, so sorry, I rather strayed, but now my, my day, my month is divided, as far as my Sotheby's hat is concerned, between 
trying to get paintings, major paintings to sell, which involves going around seeing a lot of big collectors and knowing where the great pictures are. And then when we come to sale time, when the sale has gone to the printer and the, the, the lots are all ready for sale on a particular date, one switches from from sourcing the works of art to selling them. Then it becomes a very feverish time of we exhibit the paintings in many different parts of the world, particularly if they're great paintings, great works of sculpture. And we um, often go with them. We try to engage major collectors to make them buy. And then just occasionally, it all works, it all falls into place. And miraculously, we had one of those sales at Sotheby's Two, day, two nights ago, last Tuesday, um, when everything went incredibly well, we sold a Giacometti sculpture for $101 million. We sold a Modigliani sculpture for $70 million. We sold a Van Gogh flower picture for $63 million. Everything went well. But there are, there are plenty of times when it doesn't, too. So, um, that, that's that's a, a quick, a quick, well, not a very quick answer, actually. It went, went on rather a long time. I apologize. But thank you for such an interesting question, anyway. <laughs> the next question's up here at the top. Uh, yes, as the um, entry of hedge fund billionaires into the art market done more than just rise, uh, raise prices stratospherically, and number, the question number two I had is, where did this uh, monk, end up getting hung? Well, um, as far as hedge funds and the sort of large amounts of money that hedge fund managers bring into the market are concerned, I think uh, there is, it's interesting that there are a certain number of hedge fund managers who have gone in there motivated, presumably by investment and status, but have actually become so engaged with the art, that they've become very, very serious collectors. And um, it's fascinating to watch that process take place. Uh, this connects up with your second question about the monk, because the buyer of the monk, I can say it because it's totally in the public domain, the buyer of the monk uh, was the um, great financial wizard, um, Leon Black, and Leon Black has one of the great art collections. Really, he's got tremendous, tremendous eye and tremendous discrimination and, of course, very, very deep pockets. But he is an illustration of someone who has come into the, to the collecting world with, as I say, very deep pockets and has built the most tremendous collection. Anyway, he bought the Scream and he has loaned it to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, so it is visible there, which is, a great, which is great news. And thankfully, it is something I think that happens more and more, that um, the people who are buying great art are more and more prepared to lend it to museums, which is a very good compromise, I think. Next question down here on your right. I was wondering if you would comment about Portrait of Wally by Sheila and the legal goings on and the effect that that would have on the price of something if you know that there's going to be a uh, legal squabble about it and the interchange between museums. Well, I think um, any legal squabble about ownership is completely disastrous uh, when it comes to trying to sell uh, something on the art market. It's just not worth putting anything up for auction, for instance, until you have got totally, um, total clarity and total acceptance of who owns the painting. Um, this is very different from what used to happen before 1987, 1990, uh, when all this um, extra information, archival information came out and one was able to do more research. 
the auction houses have changed totally since that time in that huge resources are now put into research of provenance, research of these sort of things, so that every single lot that is sold in Sotheby's and Christie's is really properly researched now. And this is a lot of extra work, of course, but as I say, it simply isn't worth putting something up for auction unless there is total clarity about the ownership. Here's the last question here. Oh, uh, I wondered if um, not all of us are left Rembrandts. <laughs> Um, and those of us who do, say, come into the possession through inheritance or whatever of paintings of some renown, if not in that same class, what do you suggest a person does with finding out um, about their value and kind of what to do with them afterwards if they want to sell? I mean, there's, I know there's lots of stuff on the internet like uh, ask, mutual art and ask art and stuff like that, but do you have any helpful hints for the small collection inheritors? <laughs> well, certainly uh, it's important to know what you've got. And there are many helpful sites, I think, now that you can turn to. But, I mean, you actually, although Sotheby's and Christie's don't sell everything that is referred to them, huge amounts of art is referred to them for uh, expert opinion. And I think we do give an awful lot of, uh, of, of, of benefit to people by um, these opinions. So, I mean, I think if you've got something that might be in any way interesting, it's worth starting by uh, sending an image of it by email to Sotheby's or Christie's, and then work down from there. I mean, if they say this isn't for us, but it's so and so, you know, you can go to a more local auction house or more local expert. But it is um, absolutely essential to, um, to, to, to pin these things down. I mean, I, I, as I say, when I used to appear on the Antiques Roadshow, it was constantly a question of letting people down gently as to their expectations. Um, and, but I think, you know, it was, in a way, it was, it was almost a relief sometimes um, when one did say to people, well, look, it's a, lovely, it's a lovely painting, but it's not by anyone of any note. Take it home and enjoy it. And actually, some people really were quite relieved about that. So, you know, okay, I don't have to insure it. And... Uh, you know, that, that, that too is, it's important to get it straight anyway. So as I said, Philip will be signing books in the atrium. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Most of all, thank you, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.